think in most people's lives, in most Christians' lives, prayer is boring. Uh, prayer is you, you're typically boring. Like, like who, who can relate to prayer being boring in your life? Like, be honest right now. Like, the Lord is convicting you. Um, okay, may, who prays? Okay, raise your hand. How, who prays? Okay, there's a few who don't pray. Right, then I'm glad you're here this morning. I'm glad you're here. Too late. You can't raise your hands anymore. No, no. I saw you. God saw you. I, I know. We're good. <laughs> this morning is for you. But, but prayer, prayer is something that, that we, we have a hard time kind of getting into. Uh, and, and, and even like even with worship, sometimes it's a hard, hard to get into worship. Like, why are you guys singing so sad songs? You know, I'm already sad. And I think sometimes we miss it uh, of, of what, like, what it is because we, we, we default to it's hard, so I'm just not going to do it. And, and then we claim that, oh, it's just a weakness. One of my weaknesses is, is that I don't pray. Who's ever said that or thought that? Who knows anybody who thinks that? Um, and, and see, my hand is, is raised too because I'm like, God knows everything. Like even with our um, coffee thing is like, okay, God, we didn't really have to pray and you just kind of did it just because you love us. Like that icing on the cake was like so, like, so, so powerful. Um, and so as I was kind of um, like, like reading through it and, um, and, and, and even just like diving in, like why is it so hard for people to pray? Not just people like you guys, but for us. Why is it so hard for us to, to pray? Jesus, we read this in Mark chapter uh, 135. That Jesus, as the Son of God, who God manifested on earth, like of all the people who did not need to pray. We read that Mark records that very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up and went out and made his way to a deserted place. And he was praying there. And I think it's really amazing because it gives us something, some insight into Jesus' life. And I know we know this. I know that no one's like, hey, Jesus never prayed. Um, but we know he prayed, but the, the, the interesting thing is that it was not sporadic. It was not spontaneous because for me, it's easier for me to just pray spontaneously. Who's with me? Like we need to pray. Let's go. And, 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 and I'll pray. I'll pray spontaneously and it's beautiful. But when we look at Jesus, we see a pattern. We see something that's a little more, more intentional, more, more pre-planned. And I think there's, there's wisdom in pre-planned prayer. I mean, and it doesn't mean to eliminate spontaneous prayers, but, but our prayers are those things that it's really hard to do because we are not intentional about it. We just kind of go on the fly. And so we usually pray about four things. So when you pray, and this is what you repeat on a regular basis, just kind of slowly raise your hand so that you and God can see. No one else has to see. But when we pray, we're like, okay, God, um, forgive me. God, forgive me. I messed up this morning. I messed up yesterday. So we just say, God, forgive me. All right. Uh, God, help me. I have so much issues. I have so much things that I need to do. God, help me. I just, I need your help. God, give me. I'm asking for certain things, doorways to be open for you to save my husband or my wife. Maybe you're praying for give me a house or a car or Lamborghini or, um, or just a Toyota's fine too. Um, <laughs> Do you guys see, like, it's so hard this morning? Um, or, or God bless me. God bless me. And then God, thank you. Who prays like that? Who, if you can really be honest, say, that's kind of my prayer in some sort of form or, or another. God, forgive me. God, help me. God, give me. God, bless me. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. And, who, and how many of us can get this done in, like, two minutes flat? Some of you are, like, one and a half minutes. I got this. And if you do this once a day, you're like, yes, I pray. And then if you don't pray, we look at that as a sickness. We say, well, you know, Paul, he had a thorn in his flesh. So prayerlessness for me is like a weakness. I'm still a growing Christian and I'm trying to, it's just, it's a weak area in my life. And you know, what's interesting with that, I just want to kind of like take that and take that off the table, that excuse off the table. First Samuel 12, 23 says, moreover, as for me, Far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord by ceasing to pray for you. But I will instruct you in the good and the right way. Um, that's a gripping verse. Because it tells us that prayerlessness 
is not a weakness, it's actually sin. And I want to take that excuse off the table this morning. When we read Jesus, he, he got up early in the morning. It said that, that this is intentional for him because he realized and he knew that prayer was not just, hey, I'm going to be on my way. You know, I'm busy. Prayer is going to take some time. Truth is no. Prayer is not just, prayerlessness is not just you know, it, it, just, it, it is a sin, but a lot of times we justify because we say we don't have time. We don't have time to pray. I got to go, I got to go, got to go. And the truth is this prayer does not take time. It actually saves us time. We have to think of it in a different perspective. And this idea of even there's power in prayer, um, people see this like, you know, prayer works, there's power in prayer. I, I know what you're saying, but the truth of the matter is there is no power in prayer. Actually, power comes from Jesus. So just because you pray doesn't mean that there's going to be power behind, what, be behind your prayer. Because every person prayers, prays. They pray to themselves. They pray to the government. They pray to, the, to idols. They pray to uh, a God that's they formed in their own imagination. Your Jesus, your, your version of the God of the Bible, the one that you've constructed so that uh, you just need someone to agree with you on everything that you say and do. So if you're for it, God's for it. If you're against it, God's against it. So you've created God in your image, and you're praying to this God, and you're like, yeah, there's power in prayer, guys. Let's, let's pray. So we have to kind of like begin to think differently about prayer, because prayer is not just words. And this is my big point. Like, if you take anything from this morning, I'm on, we're going to talk some logistical stuff with prayer. But prayer, to me, and this is kind of a big revelation even for me, is that prayer... Even though it includes words, it's not about words. Prayer is about being in God's presence and having God take us on a journey. So if we can start thinking about prayer as a journey, not just words that we speak. Are you with me so far? Does that make sense? Prayer is incense before God, we read in Psalms. And so a lot of times we think we're done praying when we're done speaking. And we never ask the question, is, the, is God done with us? Like, think about it. We have made prayer so ego and self-centric that we leave God out of the equation completely, except if he doesn't answer our prayer then we blame him or blame that we tried prayer, prayer doesn't work. Many times we don't know whether God is done with us because we don't really seek him. We just want to speak. We just want to say things. And this is why there is... There's something to be said about spontaneous prayer... There, and so I'm not disqualifying that, but I'm also looking into what well, Jesus was intentional about praying. So I, I want to talk about I want to talk about that because if we're going to be intentional about praying, and we realize that praying is going somewhere with God, then I want to be intentional about going somewhere with God. And when I want to go somewhere with God, two minutes ain't gonna cut it. Hurry up, God! I've got to do this. Got to do this now. I think when we pray, God weeps because of how much we are self-centered when it comes to prayer. Jesus lived it out, and he gave us a, a little thing that I read, Luke 11, verse 1. He was praying in a certain place, and when he finished, one of his disciples asked him to teach them because Jesus lived a life that prayed, and it was one of those questions where one of the few things that the apostles actually asked Jesus to teach them they saw him do miracles. They saw him prophesy. They saw him just do all sorts of amazing things where your mind is blown because your eyes are seeing something that your mind cannot comprehend. And of all the things they've seen, the thing that really attracted them to say, hey, what is the secret sauce to what Jesus is doing? He's praying. Okay, Lord, teach us how to pray. 
And I'm not going to get into the Lord's Prayer this morning because that's, that's a, and, and, and I could. I want to do something else today. But before I get into that, I really want to talk about what I read in the beginning where it says, Mark 1, 35 says, very early in the morning while it was still dark, he got up and went out and made his way to a deserted place and he was there praying. So I want to do a quick Three quick logistical things about prayer. And as we are in the 21 days of purpose, we are praying and reading the Bible for 21 days. And I know it's easier for us to read the Bible because it's there. We read it and we're done. Um, But if you guys are following the devotional, it tells you to read it four times. All of a sudden, it's like you cannot just read it once and say, I did it. Now, be honest. In your heart, raise your hand if that's what you are doing. Yes, I'm on 21. There's a purpose. I read it once. Check mark. Yes, I did it. <laughs> but the directions say read it four times and has different purposes. Why? We're trying to change our life. We're not trying to add on 21 days of purpose by pr- adding prayer to our life, adding p- uh, scripture into our life. We, we, we cannot afford to do that. We cannot afford to do that because we become religious. And it's still about us. I read it, and I'm going to pray right now. So Jesus... Three things that he did real fast, and then I'm going to get into the, the, the juice of what I, what I want to talk about this morning. Number one, he set a time. He set a time to go and pray. He wasn't praying while he was, and, and trying to kill time at the same time. Like you're at the red light, you're at the doctor's office, you're at the lawyer's office, you're at the DMV. Well, you probably won't pray at the DMV because that's going to take a long time. <laughs> you probably <laughs> you don't show up. To do your two minutes and then, you know. But now, if you have to go to the DMV and there's no social media, you're stuck. You're stuck. But he wasn't like doing it, hey, by the way, by, by the time we get from here to here, I'm going to do it. No, he dedicated time. And for him, it was early in the morning where he can spend time with his father. And this doesn't mean that, hey, you guys get up early in the morning. Because then you have to define what is early, four in the morning. Five in the morning, seven in the morning, nine in the morning for us musicians, 11 in the morning. You know, how does your schedule, you have to figure out what is going to be the best time where you can actually dedicate time where it's uninterrupted. Right now with the messes of public schools and, and homeschooling and virtual learning, you know, you thought you had time and, and yet all of a sudden you, you know. So now you have to figure out in your life when is going to be the best time. Um, and I'm not a morning person, so this has been a struggle, but I, I do, if I was to lean in any direction, I would lean into the morning aspect of prayer because, because it sets your pace. It sets our days. We're not giving God the leftover. We're giving God the first fruit. So Jesus said time. This is the when. Second, he secured a place. He secured a place. He had a destination where he had to go to away from everyone so that he can be alone so that the disciples don't bother him, people don't bother him because he was a busy person. He was popular. He was in demand. And it was not like he just had great words, but people were seeking him because they had physical needs that they wanted Jesus to meet. Can you imagine if people were chasing you because you can heal people? I have a headache. Okay. My, my toenail is broken. Okay. We're starving, okay? Like, 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 there's the things that Jesus did, the books cannot contain them. So you, can you imagine the flood of things that Jesus did, even though people were asking him selfishly? Like we do, right? We want things because we're like, oh, it's about us. But Jesus still did stuff. So he knew, he knew in his life he had to carve out and secure a place not just set a time but secure a place and the place is not as you're going to the destination the place is your destination you can pray as you're going there but you're going to a specific place dedicated specifically to spending time with god undistracted environment where you can pray out loud where you can silence your devices where you won't be interrupted The third thing is um, start a plan, not on a go. Be intentional, because being intentional is being purposeful. Being intentional is purpose. This is how. So all the things that I just read about setting a time, securing a place, getting there, starting a plan, that's going to take you more than two minutes. So I hope that you, if you just prayed casually up to today, you throw your prayer out.
Because now, prayer is not words that we say. Prayer is a journey that we go on with our Creator. Changes everything about our prayer life. Because then it puts us in a position where we are abiding in Him. We're abiding. We're not visiting. We're not going through a drive through We're abiding in him. And John 15, 7 says this, if you abide in me, and then he says, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. We say, hey, just ask God whatever. God's like, no, if you abide in me, you're with me. We're present, you and me. And then in this plan, there is a place where his word can be received so that his word can abide in us. It changes our ground and it puts us in a position to be able to ask God. And he says, for whatever, and it will be done. But if you just wake up and you say, oh man, God, I'm late. All the lights green in Jesus' name. Where's my anointing? Sprinkled anointing. Who's, is, am I the only one who's done that? You know, you fought with your spouse. In the morning, you're like, Jesus. You know, I pray he forgets everything I said. <laughs> but we just, we kind of like, <laughs> this is so, so abiding, abiding in him. So now I want to switch gears a little bit. Because I think there's a pattern for prayer as well. So once we kind of figure out the logistical things, I think there, there's a beautiful prayer in Scripture. And there, there's actually a few of them. And so I don't know if there's a perfect you know, logistical thing because this is about a journey with Jesus. But I do want to give you guys something that we can actually try out and step into starting today and for this next week and two weeks. Every single day, create a pattern and follow a pattern of prayer. So whatever your prayer looked like this past week, we're going to step it way, way up. Um, so Exodus chapter 25, verse 9, and then we're going to park in Exodus chapter 40, verses 1 through 16. And, um, and, and so when we park there, the, that will be on the screen. Um, but I want to read um, this exchange between God and Moses. Um, G- Moses and God had this moment. There was a place that was set up. There was a time um, that Moses set up with God so that God can talk with him. And he was with God, and this is where he, we get the Ten Commandments um, from. God showed him. And also, this is where God showed him how to build a tabernacle. Because God wanted, once he, once he del- delivered his people uh, from, the Egyptian, from the Egyptians, and, and they went into the desert, um, one of the things is that God wanted to be in their midst. And so he, he instructed Moses to build the tabernacle. Who's ever heard of the tabernacle, the Moses tabernacle? Most of you, if you've ever been in church in any capacity, you, you, you know kind of what I'm talking about. And it's one of those things where there's so many details and what they did we don't do. So a lot of, to- a lot of times you look at these things and we're like, I don't know if that's really helpful because that, that was then. Now we got the Holy Spirit. We don't need none of that. Not so fast. <laughs> Not so fast. There, the Bible is filled with symbols and shadows. And so when we read the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, we still see God's hand, how he did things with people, because you know God doesn't change. God's not like, hey, I'm the Old Testament God. All right, Jesus, thank you. Now I can be the New Testament God. No, God is the same. But how he dealt with people based on covenants was different. This is what we're talking about last couple of weeks. The anointing would fall on people, and then it would lift God would anoint a king, and then when the king didn't do what, what God was instructing him, and, and especially like with Saul, and he tried to do his own thing, God lifted his, that, that anointing and placed it on David. So, so the Holy Spirit was different. The Holy Spirit was everywhere, but also as it manifested, it, it, it came on people for certain tasks, uh, whether for a short time or for certain offices. And there's still symbolism and amazing things there. But Exodus 25, verse 9, I want to talk about the tabernacle. Uh, and, then, and this is what God is telling Moses. According to all that I am going to show you, as the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all its furniture, just so you shall construct it. 
The Bible is filled with shadows, and I think the tabernacle is a shadow. And it, it represents a lot of different things. And today I just want to focus on, on, on a way where we can use the tabernacle to, to create a prayer pattern for our lives. Um, so chapter 40, and because I'm so good at articulating and describing, I don't have any pictures to show you guys. But then the Lord is good, so actually we did come up with some pictures. <laughs> oh, you're welcome. Uh, but if you don't talk back to me, I will not show you the pictures and just describe them. Thank you. I, I figured you would be like, please, pictures. Please, pictures. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to read. We're going to read chapter 40. We're going to read these 16 verses, and then we're going to just talk about them. So it's going to be up on the screen to some extent. And if you have your Bibles, you can open them. Uh, but this is found in Exodus chapter 40, verses 1 through 16. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, and this is after he already told him, hey, I'm going to give you a pattern. This is how you should construct it. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, on the first day of the first month, you shall set up the tabernacle of tent of meeting. You shall place the ark of the testimony there, and you shall screen the ark with the veil. You shall bring in the table and arrange what belongs on it, and you shall bring in the lampstand and amount it and mount its lamps. Moreover, you shall set the gold altar of incense before the ark of the testimony and set up the veil for the doorway to the tabernacle. You shall set the altar of burnt offering in front of the doorway of the tabernacle, of the tent of meeting. Verse 7, you shall set the uh, lever between the tent of meeting and the altar and put water in it. You shall set up the court all around and hang up the veil for the gateway of the court. Verse 9, then you shall take the anointing oil and anoint the tabernacle and all that is in it and shall consecrate it and, and all its furnishings and it shall be holy. That's powerful. Verse 10, you shall anoint the altar of burnt offering and all its utensils and, and consecrate the altar and the altar shall be most holy and you shall anoint the lever and its stands stand and consecrate it. Verse 12, then you shall bring Aaron and his sons to the door of the tent and meeting and wash them with water. You shall put the holy garments of Aaron and anoint him and consecrate him and he may minister as a priest to me. Verse 14, you shall bring his sons and put tunics on them, and you shall anoint them even as you have anointed their father, that they may minister as priests to me. And their anointing will qualify them for a perpetual priesthood throughout their generations. Verse 16, thus Moses did according to all that the Lord had commanded him to do. tabernacle, the tent of meeting, was set up in the middle of all the tribes, making God's presence central to his people. That's a big, big clue of how we need to reshape our minds to make the presence of God central. And I understand when people say, put God first, I just don't agree with it. Because you have to put God as only. He has to be the only one. And for him to be the only one, he has to be the centerpiece of our lives. So they laid it out and all the tribes of Israel surrounded the tabernacle. And they had it face a certain way. And whenever they first set it up, um, God sent fire from heaven to light the sacrifice. And when God lit the sacrifice that we're going to get to in a second, thus those coals, it, was, it never stopped being lit. And that's going to be important. Once God lit it, the fire never died out. And so the tabernacle, what, what, why is it such, such an important piece of thing? Um, well, let's show a picture and let's talk about it. And how it relates to uh, this pattern that I want to talk about today for, for prayer. Um, so the, the, the tabernacle, tent of meeting, it has three parts. So if we can get the picture up on the screen. 
because I want to I want to kind of point and talk to it. Um, and there's a lot of details, and I want to like if I just start talking about the details, we, we will be here for two or three hours just talking about the details. So I I really just encourage you guys to read it, research it. There's a lot of amazing things. But as you can see, so um, the whole what you see where that smoke is kind of that's where the incense is. And so there's a whole new thing, thing there. And so when, when um, God was talking to Moses, he was talking with him about the, from the inside out. You have the Ark of the Covenant, which has stuff, which is the holiest of holies. That's one of the places. And then you have the next part, which is the holy place, which the veil divides the holy of holies and the holy place. And then you have the third part, which is the outer court. And so if we can, if we can just keep the picture up for, for a while, then you have the outer court. Um, so all these fences and all these things, this, this was set up so that people cannot peek into what's happening there. And there was no door except at the front of where the whole thing is. So, and the way that they did it, the way that they constructed it was that you could not climb over it and you cannot climb under it. There was just one way to get in. And it was called, oh, I'm going to get into it in a second. Um, but that was the one entrance. So I'm just going to talk about how we do this in prayer. Um, the first part right here is called the gate. And if you guys know anything about the Bible, the gate represents Jesus. So, a lot of, so when we come to pray, this is set up in the desert. And so when you're coming into here, you're, you're set up in the desert, and in the desert is a place where there is always lack, right? You're thirsty, you're hungry, things are not in the best way. But when we pray, and we, if you use this model, the first thing that we got to do is we got to come to the gate, who is Jesus. And this is the part that is the most difficult part because this is the part where we go from our flesh and stepping into another realm in a way where we start talking with Jesus and not just talking to ourselves. The reason why this is a hard place to kind of get to from this to talking to Jesus in prayer is because it requires us to wait. And when we don't have a plan to pray, we do things quickly and we never really wait upon Jesus. Isaiah 40 verse 31 says, um, says I, I don't have it here. But um, the waiting begins in the desert and begins in a dry place. And so whenever we, um, whenever we have like ministry time here, uh, this is one of the things that we do. When we have prayer at 930, we, we are like silent because we don't want our words to be repetition, repetitive, just God do this, God do this. We want to wait upon Jesus, make Jesus show up. Because here's, here, here's why it's important. Um, when you wait upon Jesus to show up, then you stop praying into thin air and start talking with Jesus. Most of our prayer is boring. is because we're talking to a God that we understand mentally. God, I pray to you, I ask you, and he's out there. But we, we don't really experience that he is here with me right now. Like, like if, 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 if we just like pause, like even this morning, like right, just right now, we just pause and just be like, you don't even have to say anything. A lot of times we feel like we need to announce, okay, God, I'm ready. I'm here. God, I'm here. just want to let you know. Just finish up whatever else you're doing. But what if we just say, okay, this is the moment. Because if you, don't, if you try to do this on your own, you're going to become really religious. And your prayer is going to be boring. And who wants to do that. So this is the hard part because we have to wait for Jesus. And this is where you can worship him. This is where you can just like, like to me this really works. This is where I like dive into like worship music and just come play something softly and just focus on him, who he is, what his goodness. But I just wait, wait on him because my, for me it's important that he shows up. He is the gate. I have to go through him to do anything else. And for some of us, this may take us an hour <laughs> Two hours. 
once you start work, once you create this pattern and, 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 and see how God does it, it may take as little as 15 minutes, 10 minutes, 30 minutes. It, it all depends because, again, Jesus, show up in 10 minutes. We're not going to do that. But, but here's a challenge because this is where a lot of us will either do this or not because we are not accustomed to waiting for Jesus. But if I told you that if you wait long enough for Jesus, he will show up, is it worth the wait? Is it worth the wait? Because now it ceases to be about us, and we're waiting on the, the, the guest of honor. Wow. And when he shows up, the, the battle with the flesh, it's overcome. Because that's the hard part. That's where the flesh kicks in. You're hungry. Did you forget to turn this off? Did you do this? What about that? What's on TV? What's this? What's that? And that's that battle where we cannot tune things out. So we have to carve this mind, and, and the battle with the flesh begins. But it is overcome when we wait enough and Jesus does show up. And now, when he shows up, and when you've done this before, you know he doesn't say, okay, Jesus, I'm here. You know, you're like, whoa, someone just entered my space. Like, it's that real. And if you've never done this before, you're going to figure out, you'll sense something, and you may not know fully what it is, but this is why it's beautiful, because it's part of this journey. And so when he shows up, all of a sudden, we begin to talk to Jesus, and we stop praying redundantly and boring, and, and, and we stop forcing our, our prayer because now we're actually talking to Jesus. And I'm telling you, I'm telling you, if you talk to Jesus versus talk to thin air, you can talk for a long time. You are got, you're you're going to be like, can I have another few hours? Because that's where it really goes. And so when we overcome the flesh by just waiting, the Lord does show up. And when the Lord shows up, things slow down. We begin to have perspective. Our words become meaningful and weighty. All this nonsense of God bless me, God give me this, God this, God this, it just flies out the window. It flies because now you're with the Lord. And when you're with the Lord, things change significantly. And I love what A.W. Tozer said. He, said. he said that before a man can seek God, God must first have sought the man. So when we go into and go and wait for Jesus, Jesus has to come and seek us out. Now, just curious to see where we are, if I need to go on or not this morning. For who, this is kind of like a revelation. Just raise your hand. Like, you've never thought about this before. This is really interesting, intriguing, where you're like, I need to try this. What's going on? Okay. I would encourage. I would encourage. All of us. So, so now that we go through the gate, let's put the picture back up. The next thing that we come to is the brazen altar of sacrifice. So Jesus, now we're walking with Jesus. Jesus takes us to this Thing. And it's built, and I'm not going to talk about details of it. I promise you, you have to read it. It's really, really interesting, the size and what it does. This is where when it, they first put it together, God set it on fire, and all the ashes, they, they, they held them, they collected them so that it never burns out, God's fire. But this is where you walk with Jesus. And this is, once you're with him, when you get to this point in our prayer, this is where you look at the cross of Jesus. This is where you have conviction. This is where repentance is. This is where we realize our brokenness. This is where we're like, we're a mess. There is no substitute for repentance. It's not just saying I'm sorry, but it's realizing that it took Jesus, the Son of God, for him to shed his blood so that I can be forgiven. Time does not wash sin away. Only the blood of Jesus does that. Only the blood of Jesus does that. And so this is where Jesus may lead you to be like, okay, because this is what, you know, how, how do we pray for sin? God, forgive me for all the bad things in Jesus' name. All right, now here's what I want. 
But what if, and because sin is committed individually, what if we repent for those sins that have been committed individually, individually? So when you were cross with your spouse yesterday, you don't say, God, forgive me for everything. May God forgive me for my lack of patience with my spouse. Do you think that's going to have a lot more significance than just saying, God, forgive me for everything? That's what I do with my kids whenever they do something and they get in trouble. I always, once they're done with their whatever it is, that the consequences, I always come and ask them, so what happened? Why were you in time out? Why were you disciplined? What are you going to do? I want them to acknowledge it, not just to be like, oh, I was bad or I was this. No, I want them to be specific so that they can understand the significance and the weight that our sin has. But also, when you're standing in front of the, sacri- the, the, the altar, you realize that Jesus' blood is there to cover and forgive. And so no matter how grave our sin is, we know that Jesus' blood is powerful enough to wash our sin. And be honest, you know, there's a lot of things that we can't remember. So we just don't remember them. So just, God, forgive me for all for things that, you know, that I've done in the past that you don't remember. Our hearts have to be broken over sin. This is where we have it so wrong in America. We teach the God of love and don't teach a lot about the fact that this God of love had to die because our sin was so serious. Repentance is not just I'm sorry and speak it out. It's, it's, it's a broken a heart. And I love, again, I'm going to do one more quote from A.W. Tozer. Uh, God cannot use a man or a woman greatly until he wounds, uh, wounds them deeply. If, if there's not, if your sin doesn't have weight, then you're just saying, I'm sorry, forgive me, and it means nothing. You have to carry the weight of, our, of your sin. I have to carry the weight of my sin so that we can then transfer that to Jesus, and we don't have to carry it. But it has to have weight for our repentance to have any significance. And this is why in the Old Testament, they would bring sacrifices to these things, because the, those sacrifices, those lambs, they would cover their, their, their sin, so they would project all their sin onto the lamb, and the lamb would die, be sacrificed for their sin. And there was another thing, a scapegoat, you know, which is a whole other thing. I'm, I'm just giving you stuff that you guys should look into, like it's, it's awesome stuff. So, so now you're with Jesus, you've met Jesus, you're walking with him, and now you're repenting. I don't know how long that's going to take for you guys. If you haven't repented for a while, you may spend a lot of time there, you know. But then the third part is the brazen la- laver or laver or ha- um, laver that people say differently. This is where the priests, after the sacrifice, they wash their hands um, and feet. It's a large basin, and it's like covered with mirrors. Um, and so as we repent with our sins, we are washed with the blood of Jesus, and he cleanses all of our sins. He sanctifies us. So now, now when we go into prayer, we are not sin conscious anymore where God is good, conscious. He's my savior, conscious. You know, and it was really interesting because this thing was like, people don't really know how it was designed, but it had like mirrors. And so um, you can see like reflection. If you're dirty or whatever, it kind of like reflects everything back. So you, you, you wash yourself before moving into the next step. So this was the outer court. Now, if you think about this, as you like mentally envision how this is gonna look like in, in your part, we've only done three things so far. Three things, met up with Jesus, repented for our sins, and allowed Jesus' blood to wash us from all of our iniquities and all of our sins. Now we can enter the holy place. The holy place symbolizes a deeper intimacy with Jesus. And there's three things in the holy place. So if we can get the picture, picture number two. Well, I don't know if it's, no, no. Yeah, do picture number two. This is, so this is picture number three. It's fine. We can do both of them. So, okay, leave this, leave this. So now this is the holy, there's two parts in this. There's a holy of holies, which we're going to get into, and there's a holy place. But the way that it was layered, it was like from the outside, this, this, this layer from the outside was like, like seal skin of some sort. And so it didn't really look so appealing. 
But then on the inside, you have, you have all these linens and fabrics that were just like, wow, the walls were, were gold. Like everything was like, had so much elegance in it. Where, where in the desert, this thing on the inside stood out. On the outside, from the outside, it was mysterious. But on the inside, it was like, what is happening inside of here? And I think that re- represents a Christian life's a lot too, because when you go deep with God, it, everything just explodes. You're like, what? There's so much here. On the outside, oh, you're just a regular person. You read your Bible, you pray. Yeah. <laughs> but once I get through there, come out, it's, it changes everything. So, so, it's, it's, so, so there's three pieces inside. So if we can picture number three, and we'll stay here for, for a second. So number four, there is um, a table of showbread. And this is a table where the priest placed the 12 special loaves of bread to represent the 12 tribes of Israel. And what was interesting is that the bread stayed there and, um, and it would not go stale. And the priests would actually have to eat the bread whenever they replaced it. And the bread can signify, and this is, this is something where we go deeper with God. The bread signifies, <laughs> signifies, uh, signific- signifies, thank you. Yes, y'all are listening. Um, It represents the word of God, our bread of life. So now we're not just praying. Now there's scripture involved because when we partake in his word, what we read earlier, you know, abide in me and let my words abide in you. All of a sudden, God's word begins to get into our minds and into our hearts and begins to renew our mindsets. Begins to change how we think about things in light of being with Jesus, in light of the sin, in light of walking into this another dimension with God. And now the word is our bread. We rely on it so you can open up your scripture, start reading. Um, you know, we're in chapter 8 today on John. Good. Tomorrow, chapter 9. Chapter, But this is where you allow God's word and partake and eat of the food on a regular basis, and it renews our minds, huge thing. Number five, a, the golden lampstand, a menorah, they call it, um, seven oil lamps. Um, and it was like basically carved specifically out of a solid piece of gold. So it was forged. And, and as you guys may, may have guessed, this is where the Holy Spirit enters into our lives. Because as we're reading scripture, we're eating of the bread of life. The Holy Spirit comes in and illuminates the mysteries of what God has written. The Holy Spirit begins to invade our life because now we are in the holies. Now all of a sudden, there's a different shift of you're with Jesus. You can relate to Jesus. He was a human. You can read about him. He was like you and me. The Bible says he was like one of us. He came to dwell within us and to to dwell among us. And now now we're introduced to his word. You know, John 1, 1, in the beginning was the word. The word was with God. Remember that a few days ago? John 1, 14 says that, 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 that Jesus moved into our neighborhood. He dwelt among us like the tabernacle. He dwelt among his people. That's what his goal was, and that's what Jesus did. And now we're moving we're, we're, we're with, the, with the scripture. We're reading. We're consuming. Our eyes are reading the scripture differently. We're not distracted. We're not sorry for our sin. We've been cleaned. Jesus is good. He's with us. We're learning, and the Holy Spirit just invades our mind and begins to teach us and show us, and and it just takes us even more deeper. And then the altar of incense, the priest burned an offering morning and evening. And, And this is here whenever you really, truly can enter into worship. The Bible says that incense is like, worship is like incense to God. I used this example before. Now, where it's kind of like when you turn on coffee and the beans, the aroma just, what do they do? They just go everywhere. <sighs> but now, we're not worshiping like in the morning, waking up, come to church. Oh, well, we're doing a fast song. Oh, do we have to? Oh, we're going to do a medium song. Okay. Oh, now we're going to go to the deep, slow song. People are crying. What is going on? Can we like get on with it? Because we haven't, we haven't done anything else. We just show up in this, you know. But worship, when in this worship, it's instant to God. Now, now our worship is completely different. It's deeper. We understand it more. And it's not just 
singing songs, but it, 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 it's heavy in, 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 in lifting in the gifts that God has given us. And we pray, and, and, and God is pleased. Like, like there's something, because when, when you go through these things, you realize God's pleased with you. Like you give God pleasure when you're taking the time on a journey with him. So this is, um, the, the, so that's the other piece, the altar of, of incense. And now this goes to the last, the last piece. This is where you enter. So if you get back to the picture, this is where the veil is. Picture three. So, so this is where we were. Um, and there's so much detail I can't get into. And then this is the veil, the curtain that separated the Holy of Holies from the Holy. And this is the veil that once you go through this, only a, 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 um, a priest, a specific priest could only go into that place. It was, very, it was not open to everyone. It was a sacred place because of what was in there. Um, and when Jesus died on the cross, the Bible says that the veil tore because they built a temple. It wasn't this kind of a tent of Moses, but they built a temple and the, the veil in the temple tore because Jesus broke that where he just said, now anyone can come to the Father. You don't have to go through a person besides Jesus, of course. But you don't have to go through a priest in order to get to, to, the, Father, um, to, to the Father. So, so, that's, so when you go through the veil, and this was interesting because this is where God's presence really was. Like It was like it, all of that was not so that you can park there and stay there, but it was to get you to the mercy seat, to the, to the God who then can show you his heart. Like it's, it's so, so, so beautiful. Um, there's three pieces that are in the ark. And I, like I said, I can't get into, uh, into uh, like all of them, but, um, but part of what, what's on it is a mercy seat of God, and they have these cherubims that are, like, they have their wings like this, and they're facing each other, and that cherubim, in, in, um, in the middle of the cherubim was where God's presence was, like, just there, and it was empty, and the reason it was empty is because most people who had an, uh, who worshipped any god, they had an image of the god, and so the Israelites they could not carve out an image of God because they didn't know how he looked like. And he told them, don't worship any images. And so where God's presence represented, it was nothing. So it was like you knew the presence was, of God was there. And he was, they actually tied a rope to the priest when a priest came in there with a bell. So that when the bell stopped ringing, that meant that the priest did something bad and he died. And if you would have go, if you would have went in to retrieve him, you would have died too. So they had a rope on him so they can pull him out. <laughs> That's how serious this thing was. But in that place is where God's presence was just, whoa. Like the heart of God was on display. This is where you can intercede for people. This is where they would intercede for the people. This is where God would tangibly be just welcoming you, the mercy seat, his presence. So after all that process, the goal is God, you and me. This is what it's about. God, God has to take us on this journey from wherever you find your, yourself in life today to this place where you can truly see yourself and God for what God is and for who and I, who we truly are.